Hello again, this is Rodolfo Eric Angat, your teacher in Earth and Environmental Science. Today, we'll be learning about the forces that change Earth's crust. Our essential question for today is, how is Earth's crust changed? This lesson covers standard 2.1.1 and 2.1.3. Our target competencies for these lessons are the following. I can identify factors that causes Earth's surface to change. I can give examples of fast and slow changes. I can explain why there are sand dunes in the desert. I can explain why areas without trees and other vegetation or vegetations are prone to weathering. I can differentiate physical from chemical weathering. I can differentiate weathering from erosion and even from deposition. I can identify the three types of plate movements based on pictures. And finally, I can explain the factors that can increase the rate of weathering. Let us begin this lesson by identifying those two types of forces that change Earth's crust. The first force are the forces that bring slow changes. These are weathering, erosion, and rock cycle. So these processes are natural processes, or they can also be influenced by the activities of man or human beings, but these processes happen slowly. The other type of force that can change Earth's crust are classified as forces that bring rapid changes. And this include plate movements that bring about volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tsunami, and floods. So again, these are the two types of forces that can change Earth's crust, the slow changes and the rapid changes. And this is a graphical representation of the slow changes and the rapid changes. I found this picture in the Twitter, so credit to them. So for weathering, we have the breaking of rocks into sediments. For erosion, this is the movement of sediment. So see the difference between the two? In weathering, you the rock is broken into sediments or into pieces, small pieces called sediments. While in erosion, the key word here is movement. Erosion happens when sediments move. And then deposition is when the sediments stop moving and they settle on a certain area. Weathering, erosion, and deposition all come together, and they are classified as slow changes. The fast changes are brought upon by the movement of tectonic plates. They are volcanic eruption, earthquake, landslide, tsunami, and flooding. So, I hope you remember the two types of forces that can change Earth's crust. The three types of plate boundaries that result to the changes on Earth. And these plate boundaries happen because of the movement of the tectonic plates brought upon by the convection currents happening in the mantle. And we'll be learning more about that convection currents in the mantle as we progress in our discussion on plate tectonics. So the three types of plate boundaries are divergent. As you can see, they are moving away from each other. Convergent, they are moving towards each other. And transform, they are sliding past each other. Earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and tsunami result to rapid changes on Earth's crust. Now, this is an example of a volcanic eruption. In a volcanic eruption, it all starts with the magma inside Earth. The magma in the mantle. When the pressure is too much, 
the volcano erupts. When it erupts, it releases different kinds of things. So the magma rises, produces the eruption column. This is the pyroclastic cloud and the pyroclastic density currents that goes down on the slope of the volcano. This one goes sliding down and this one goes upward. Then aside from that, the eruption cloud, it's also pyroclastic. The things that floats in the air, like the small rocks, this, those are called tephra or asphalt. And then we have the bombs, the lava dome. Then we have, of course, the lava flow and the dreaded lahar. Lahar is like sand-like material that when it is dry, it is so hard. But once it gets wet, it becomes so fluid that it rampages on the slope of the volcano and buries cities and towns on the slope. It is very uh, unpredictable. That's why it kills a lot of people. You'll be learning more about Lahar in the future. So volcanic eruption rapidly changed Earth's crust. Weathering is different from erosion and deposition. Let's begin with weathering. Weathering is the breaking of rocks into sediments. Erosion is when the wind, the water, the gravity, living things, and other agents of erosion move the sediments. In the United States, our main agent of erosion is water. Okay? Because we have a lot of water here in North Carolina. Of course, I said United States. That may not be true. It depends where in the United States. But here in North Carolina, because we have a lot of water, water is the main agent of erosion. In other areas of the United States, like in the desert areas, the main, the main agent of erosion is wind. So it all depends what area you belong to. So again, erosion refers to the moving of sediments. Deposition, on the other hand, is when the sediments loses its energy and then just settles down. That's called deposition or the settling of sediments. Weathering, erosion, and deposition are classified as slow changes on Earth's crust. Though they are slow, they can make mountains shrink, just like what happened to the Appalachian. The Appalachian Mountains to the west of North Carolina are actually gigantous mountains before, but because of weathering and erosion, they have diminished into like hills. Some of them are already very low because they have been weathered, eroded, and the eroded material has been deposited in rivers and lakes that made the rivers and lakes shallow. So this is the Appalachian, the Appalachian after a few, a few thousand years, and in the future, the Appalachians will also be flattened. And that's the position. The Appalachian Mountains are now smaller and rounded because of weathering and erosion. Weathering and erosion bring slow changes on Earth's crust. There are certain factors that we have to remember, and these factors are the ones that affect the rate of weathering. Weathering can be very, very slow, or it can be relatively fast. So what can increase the rate of weathering? The first one is surface area. If the surface area is large, then weathering is faster. Remember, when the surface area is large, weathering is faster. So when you increase the surface area, the rate of weathering also increases. The particle size. The larger the particle, the slower is the process of weathering. So larger particles weather slower and smaller particles weather faster. I need you to take 
note of the word weather here. This is not the same as the weather when we talk about sunny, windy, rainy, stormy. That's another thing. The word weather here is referring to the breaking of rocks. Again, the larger particles weather slower and the smaller particles weather at a faster rate. The third one, chemical composition. Some minerals in rocks are soluble in water. Those rocks with water-soluble minerals easily break, while those rocks with minerals that are not water-soluble or are harder don't easily break. Like granite. Granite is an igneous rock and it cannot be easily weathered. It's very strong. Some rocks like pumice is a very weak rock that you, it can easily be broken. You can actually break it with your hand if you want to. Now using a hammer, you can turn it into powder. Again, that's pumice. That's spelled as P-U-M. I C E. I hope I spelled it right. And the harder rock is the granite spelled as G R I N I T E, which is an igneous rock. So it depends upon the composition of the rock. The composition of the rock can determine if the rock can weather fast or weather slow. The next one is the climate. You need to remember this. In areas where the climate is warm and moist or hot and wet, weathering is very fast. Remember that. Weathering happens fastest in areas where the climate is warm and moist or hot and wet. So these are the factors that you need to remember about weathering. Let's now go to the next slide. So this is the surface area. When you say surface area, this is the measure of how much exposed area a solid object has. This uncrumpled paper has a large surface area because all, all of its sides are exposed. While this one has a smaller surface area because only the one that is exposed to the environment can be affected by the agents of weathering and erosion. Now, uncrumpled paper, large surface area. Crumpled paper, small surface area. This crumpled paper was this one. Okay? So, uncrumpled paper has higher surface area. Thus, if this is a rock, then this will weather faster than this one because this one has a smaller surface area. Higher surface area results to faster rate of weathering. Climate, as I've said before, affect the rate of weathering. Warmer and wetter climates result to greater rate of weathering. Colder and drier climates result to lower or slow rates of weathering. That's why in these areas, the soil is very thin, while in, in the other one, the soil is very thick and plants can thrive better because soil comes from rocks. When rocks weather, the, the rocks become soil and the soil provides the nutrients for the plants. If the soil is thin, then the plants will not grow good. Let's continue. There are two types of weathering. The two types of weathering are physical or mechanical weathering and chemical weathering. An example of a mechanical or physical weathering is frost wedging. Frost wedging happens when water seeps into the cracks in rocks and then freezes 
the thing about water is that when it freezes, it increases its volume and the increase in the volume of the water causes the cracks in rocks to become bigger, thus breaking them apart. That process is called frost wedging and frost wedging is an example of physical or mechanical weathering. Again, frost wedging is an example of physical or mechanical weathering. Water goes inside the crack in the rock, and then when it freezes, the same amount of water produces a larger or becomes larger. It increases its volume, thus the increase in the volume of the frozen water push the crack inside the rock and make it bigger and bigger until the rock breaks. Water expands when it freezes, causing frost wedging. Another example of weathering is the one that you see here. Uh, why are these rocks shaped like this? How is weathering responsible for this shape? As if someone carved these rocks into this very unique shapes. Actually, no one carved this. This happened because the minerals in the middle of the rocks were more soluble with water. The minerals here were more soluble with water. So this part of the big, huge boulder before was weathered first. So this uh, shaped rock used to be a big boulder and it was weathered like this because the minerals here were more soluble to water. And this process is called the differential weathering. Minerals in rocks are not evenly distributed. Again, differential weathering, rocks weather at different rates because of different mineral makeup, degree of jointing and exposure to the elements. More resistant rocks protrudes as ridges and pinnacles, as you can see here. It's called differential weathering. Now, another question about weathering, and of course also of erosion. Why are rocks rounded and smooth in river banks? Like look at this one, this is a river, the water is flowing. So, why are these rocks rounded and smooth? Why are they not flat? Why are not they shaped like a box or hexagonal or shaped like a diamond? Why are they rounded? The reason is when the water moves the rocks, the rocks cross and roll with each other because of the running water. And this results to the smooth rounded stones in the river. So the rolling, the crushing together of rocks results to the formation of the rounded rocks. We call that rolling and crushing as tumbling and abrasion. Okay. Now what are the agents of erosion? The agents of erosion can also be the agents of weathering. So don't get confused. Remember the di main difference between weathering and erosion is that weathering is when the rock breaks, while erosion is when the rock or the sediments are moved from one place to another. So their agents are somewhat similar. So what are the agents of erosion? We have the wind. We have the wind that blows, the water that flows, the gravity that pulls, and the glaciers that scrape. Again, in the desert, the main agent of erosion is wind. In the tropical rainforest, definitely water is the greatest agent of erosion because it always rains in the tropical rainforest. Water erosion. Running water is the major agent of erosion that has shaped the earth's surface. Remember, 
A majority of our planet is covered with water. Almost 80%. Almost. Okay. That's why our planet is called the water planet. That's why water is the one considered as the major agent of erosion. And it can also be considered as the major agent of weathering. How, what do you call these things here? So we can find them in the desert. We call them, oh, I did not show the answer, but they are formed by wind. These things here, these structures in the desert are po formed because the wind blows in the desert and the sand is the common agent of erosion in the desert. Is that right? No. The wind. The wind. This should be wind. Wind is the common agent of erosion. So wind erosion. So here it is. See what happens to the pebbles, to the rocks as the wind blows. Okay, so the wind is an agent of erosion. Desert is a type of biome that has little or no precipitation. That is why the wind blows the sand and forms the sand dunes. This structure here is called the sand dune. Spelled as A, spelled as S A N D, and then dunes D U N E S, and they are formed by the wind. The major agent of erosion in the desert, of course, is the wind because seldom that it rains in the desert. Now, the Great Sphinx, when it was built, it was full of detail. But nowadays, because of weathering and erosion, what is only left are some uh, images and then you just have to imagine how it was before okay so it's no longer as detailed as when they created it during those times now there are some things that human beings do that contribute to the changes on earth's crust and these changes are not beneficial to us they are actually hurting us. And what are these things that human beings do? These human activities include deforestation, cutting of trees, clearing forests, overgrazing when cattle and animals are allowed to eat nonstop in a grassland until the grassland becomes a desert. Overgrazing should not be done. It's okay to let the animals feed on the grass, but make sure that you make them stop by moving them to another place and then giving that place where they fed or where they graze time to recover. What other people, what other farmers do is that they just leave them there until the land becomes a desert. And that is something that we don't like. So overgrazing is not a good practice. Other things that people do or human beings do include mining, construction, and overuse of chemical fertilizer. Of course, people do this because we consume the wood. We, we use wood to build homes. So they have to cut trees so that we can have homes. Overgrazing, we eat hamburgers. So they have to they have to let the cattle eat. Mining, because we have cell phones. The things that are used to create our cell phones and other devices are derived from mining. Construction, we need buildings, hospitals, and schools. Overuse of chemical fertilizers, because we need to grow food faster but of course there are ways in which we can prevent the destruction of our environment why is it bad because these things here cause soil erosion that can lead to more problems and how can we prevent this from happening 
how can we prevent soil erosion? We can do this by planting more trees. And of course, practicing the three R's, reuse, reduce, and recycle. Now, this is the effect of deforestation. Roots of the trees bind the soil without the roots, then soil erosion can easily happen. Plants or vegetation prevent soil erosion. Grasses and ground covers break the rains, pores, shielding soil on slopes. You'll need deep-rooted trees and shrubs. So here on a plot land, you can use shrubs because what happens is that they, the, this vegetation here absorbs the pressure or the pores from the rain, thus preventing the soil from being disturbed. While on a slope, you'll need deep-rooted trees because these deep-rooted trees prevent landslide from happening in a slopey area. Now, another reason why a lot of areas are now experiencing flooding is because of urbanization. Many areas have been converted into cities. And when you talk about a city, what happens is Almost everything is covered with cement and asphalt. The problem with cement and asphalt is that it prevents the soil from absorbing the water when it rains. So all the water collects on top of the surface and when it collects together, it becomes the flood. And this flood can cause a lot of problems like ruining someone's home or destroying the property or bringing about the soil and eroding the nutrients from it and this what this is one of the effect of urbanization again urbanization is when the land is converted into a city and the city is covered with asphalt and concrete now one way to prevent flood from ruining the city or ruining a property is building a, a structure like this. This structure is what we call a levee. Now, this one is an artificial levee. It was man-made. But of course, there are also the natural levees. Now, why did they build this here? So they built the artificial levee here so that when strong rain comes, and the river overflows, the levee will stop the overflow from reaching the town on this side here. So it's just like a barricade that prevents the water from crossing over to reach the town. The problem with levees is that when the water rises too much and the levee, levee breaks, then all of the water will rampage into the town or into the city and because it would happen so fast, many of the people will be caught off guard and many of them would get hurt and their property destroyed and some would even die. So that's a problem with levies. Okay. Levy is a structure that prevents flooding. Now look at this person here. He probably have anticipated the flood coming so he created an artificial levee around his property. And because he has an artificial levee, all of the other properties around him got flooded except for him. Okay. An ingenious plan. But I wonder how he'll be driving out of this. Oh, probably he has a motorboat, right? Next one. When it comes to erosion on a slope, the big particles are always closer to the slope and the smaller particles are farther away from the slope of the mountain. You have to remember that because uh, these are too heavy, they cannot travel farther, so they will just stay closer to the slope of the mountain. The smaller particles go farther away because they can easily be carried out. Another way to prevent erosion from ruining the soil or from uh, washing away the nutrients from the soil is called terracing and contour plowing. 
This is called terracing. See, the land was shaped like a staircase and it followed the contour of the land too. That's why we call it contour flowing. Runoff is water flowing on a slope. If the land is converted into like a staircase shape, what happens is when the water flows, it flows slower. When the water flows slower, erosion also is slower. Thus, it does, thus the soil doesn't lose its nutrients. It's just like if you have a stair in your, uh, at your home, so you, you can go downstairs slowly, but then it's safer, right? Now, with this one, it slows down the runoff, thus it also slows down the erosion. It's called terracing and contour flowing. Unlike this one, because it's a slope, the water flows so fast, so since water flows so fast, runoff is very fast, so erosion is also very fast. Terracing and contour flowing slows down erosion by slowing runoff. Now, an, a, an effect of erosion is called slump erosion. You see this one here? When you see something like this along a slope, this is called a slump erosion because it is shaped like a spoon. Okay, Slump erosion is mainly due to water and gravity. Okay, I need you to remember that. These are also other examples of slump erosion. That's why I don't want to buy a property that is on top, uh, that is so close to a cliff. I don't want to lose my investment, right? Water erosion results to slump due to gravity. See, it's shaped like a spoon. In North Carolina, I found one. See this one? This is called slump erosion. It is shaped like a spoon. And that's me right there. Now this here is an example of creep erosion. It's also because of gravity. The soil is moving downward very slowly, making the fence crooked. This fence used to be straight, but because of creep erosion, now it's crooked. And it's also because of gravity. Real erosion is the removal of soil by running water through little streamlets. I'm sure you've seen something like this. We call this real erosion. Okay. So again, another example of real erosion. So they are little streamlets where water passed and carved the land to like small rivers. Now let us classify the following types of erosion or effects of erosion. Is this a landslide, mudslide, slump, or creep? Very good. It's creep and it is due to gravity. How about this one? Landslide, mudslide, slump, or creep? Look at the fence. It's a creep. Okay. Nice. Landslide, mudslide, slump, or creep? Landslide. Okay. <laughs> Next one, landslide, mudslide, slump, or creep. See that one? It's a mudslide. How about this one? Landslide, rock slide, mudslide, slump, or creep. It's a big rock. Rock slide. Landslide, mudslide, slump, or creep. It's a slump. Okay. And I hope with this uh, lesson, you are now equipped with the knowledge to get very good score in our MC assessment. Thank you so much, guys, and see you again. Bye-bye. Good luck.